I was leading my company across this hedgerow uh, from one side to the other, and uh, we were being bombed with mortars. And uh, when the dust settled, I'd had 23 men in my company either wounded or killed. And I had dove into a foxhole as everyone else tried to find one that the Germans had left. But all of them, we couldn't get all, all of us in foxholes or they couldn't find one. People got killed by concussion. Not even, no wounds on them, but they were dead from concussion. And that was one of my saddest moments because I had trained these boys. I had seen them grow from civilians into being a, a, a fighting man, a fighting soldier. Well, I got in that foxhole and I cried like a baby because I was so sad to see those, those boys that were like my brothers or my sons. And I was only 22 and that's, that was their age, 19, 20, 21, 22. Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. It was right after the Depression, and things weren't too good. And I had a friend who was going to join the Army, the 3rd Horse Cavalry at Fort Myer, Virginia. And my father said, you may as well join with him because you're probably not going to amount to much anyhow. So at the age of 17, I dropped out of high school and joined join my friend and enlisted in the 3rd Horse Cavalry at, at Fort Myer, Virginia in August of 1938. What were your impressions of some of the 3rd Horse Cavalry's most distinguished officers? Well, at the time I enlisted, Colonel Wainwright, who went on to be the famous general and was a prisoner of Bataan for, in, with the Japan, uh, was the commanding officer of the 3rd Horse Cavalry. He was a tall, statuous individual, a very good commander. In fact, he had to get permission for this other chap, Marcel Newman, and I to join the 3rd Cavalry because they were up to strength at the time. But he was a great soldier. But right after, several months after uh, Colonel Wainwright was relieved, he was relieved by Colonel George S. Patton. And that was, uh, you know, I'd heard of Colonel Patton, but uh, I did not realize that I would get to know him as well as I did at the time and then in later years, what a great general he was to be. And I, knew, I hadn't worked for him as a private. Well, one story, as I can tell, I was walking down to the stable area before I went to work for him, and I passed this major who was riding up the street. He had a pipe in his mouth and a riding crop in his hand, and I saluted him, and he returned my salute with the riding crop in his hand. And uh, Colonel Patton was at the entrance of the stable nearby, and he saw this, and this uh, major, his name was Rolf, and he hollered, Major Rolf, real loud. And he says, uh, come back here. And he told me, trooper, go back up the corner and come back down the street again. So he made the, he made the major salute me properly without the crop in his, mouth, in his hand and the pipe in his mouth. I felt 10 feet tall. So he was all spit and polished at that time. Yes, and I, a little, uh, several weeks later, I, I replaced him, his, one of his orderlies who had gone on furlough, and I worked for him for two weeks where I'd go down to the stables and help his, he had a private groom also, and help to get the horses ready for him to take exercise, for he and his daughters and son to take exercise, ride the horses. And uh, 
it was quite, a, quite an honor to be working for him. Little did I, did I know it sometime later that he would be what he became. You crossed Omaha Beach on D plus 12 in 1944. What were your impressions? Well, that was a scary time. I was in England at the time of the invasion, and we heard it on radio. We could hear the machine guns and the, the bombings and stuff. And uh, we were up in the Midlands, and we were shipped down to Southampton on trucks and stayed overnight in a, a, a large building, a warehouse at Southampton. Next morning, we were loading on uh, ships and to cross the channel. And uh, that was pretty dreadful because I can remember the, the facilities on the ship were none and it was having to be a British ship and we were eating beans and bread uh, and uh, the water was very, very rough and we couldn't go directly across. After we got out into the channel, we had to sit there for quite a while, three or four days. Now, what unit were you with when you were in England? I was uh, 331st Infantry of the 83rd Infantry Division. That had been an Ohio National Guard Division that was activated back in 42. And I went to the infantry from the cadre, from the cadre from the 3rd Cavalry, to the infantry as a staff sergeant and a radio chief because I'd been to school at Fort Monmouth. But soon after that, a couple of months after that, I promoted to master as a regimental communication chief at the age of 21. And it wasn't very bad. I was a good boy to, get, to attain the rank of 21 as a farmer boy. Could you describe in as much detail as you can your experiences around Carrot in France after relieving the 101st Airborne Division? Well, after the water settled, the, uh, the, the channel settled where we could uh, land, I had gone uh, forward uh, a couple of days before that, and I was waiting for my company to come. And uh, they we came in dribs and drabs because uh, nothing could land smoothly at that time. So in a couple of days, we got back together by having runners sent around and looking for various soldiers in various spots. And we got organized and we relieved the 101st at Carrington. I remember our regiment uh, was in a, a chateau, the regimental commander's uh, headquarters in the chateau. And uh, I, my mission at that time was to make sure that, that the, mission, the guard, the uh, Regimental CP was guarded, so I posted all my men all around in that area. But the battlefront was not too far away. You could hear machine guns, you could hear rifle fire, and you could he hear it go overhead. So we weren't too far from the front lines, uh, down where the doughboys are really dug in. George, when you crossed the beach itself at Omaha, can you recall any of the impressions? Can you recall any of the scenes? Well, yes, there were bodies still floating in the channel, and that's how I got ashore. I told my company commander that I had to go to shore because uh, I had to get my feet on the ground. So he says, okay, be waiting for us when we land. So I went over the side of the ship and caught a, um, a Coast Guard boat who was gathering up bodies and I hitchhiked a ride into Normandy. And things were still going on. There were still bombings. Uh, the planes were still flying over and uh, we knew we were at war. That we were gonna get into it soon. Thickly. Once at Carrington, did you ever meet the enemy face to face? And if you did, what were your impressions of them? Well, at that time, I never met uh, an enemy face to face until uh, we broke out on July the 4th and we tried to get through the hedgerows. And the Germans were fighting a defensive a battle. And that's much easier to fight a defensive battle than it is to be advancing because they know where they are and you don't know where you're going. So my first time that I uh, actually talked to a German, he was a first sergeant who we had captured, and he was smartly dressed, and I knew he was a first sergeant by his insignia, and I walked up to him and introduced myself as a first sergeant of this company that he was now missed, and um, uh, we talked for a while, and he had a pair of leather gloves with the, uh, uh, like mittens, but they had a trigger finger, and I admired these gloves. And uh, I asked him, I says, you know, you're going to lose these gloves somewhere down the line. I'd like to have them. He said, well, I'd like to keep them because my mother gave them to me for Christmas. And I couldn't argue with him on that. So he went in for an interrogation uh, before he was shipped to the rear. And when he came out, evidently somebody told him that somebody's going to take your mittens from you. So he sent a runner after me. And when I got back to where he was, he handed me the mittens. 
and which to, I still have them to this day. Do you ever know what had happened to that, uh, that captured POW? No, I don't, but he was probably shipped to the States and worked on a farm somewhere and lived happily ever after. His, the war was over for him and I was just starting. After the Normie campaign, your unit participated in the takeover of the Brittany Peninsula, south of Normandy. And the idea was to seize the ports along the coast of Brittany. What was the campaign like for your unit and for you, the ordinary soldier? Well, going, going through the hedgerows, it was, it was tough because you were close to the front lines. The bullets were going snapping over your head and mortar fire uh, was landing all around. I was leading my company across this hedgerow uh, from one side to the other and uh, we were being bombed with mortars and uh, when the dust settled I'd had 23 men in my company either wounded or killed and I had dove into a foxhole as everyone else tried to find one that the Germans had left but all of them we couldn't get all, all of us in foxholes or they couldn't find one and there were apple trees throughout this uh, hedgerow and uh, as a mortar shells would hit an apple a tree, it would be it blast. So a lot of people got killed by concussion. Not even no wounds on them, but they were dead from concussion. And that was one of my saddest moments because I had trained these boys. I had seen them grow from civilians into being a, a, a fighting man, a fighting soldier. And that had been a two-year period. And when we got the ones evacuated and the killed and wounded evacuated. Uh, and the dust had settled, I got in that foxhole and I cried like a baby because I was so sad to see those, those boys that were like my brothers or my sons, and I was only 22, and that's, that was their age, 19, 20, 21, 22. That was a sad occasion in, in the hedgerows. Um, there's one story that I tell about a boy by the name of Malloy. When we landed in the Midlands and had some passes to go to town before we went into the invasion, uh, he had missed bed check. And uh, the charge of quarters told me the next morning that Malloy had missed bed check. Bed check means you had to be in by 10 o'clock at 10.30 or 10 30, 11 o'clock. So I called him into my make-believe orderly room and I chewed him out and I made him out another pass and I had him dig a hole out in the field about four or five feet deep, and I dropped the pass in the hole. I said, the next time you want to pass, you'll dig that one up. And that, at that time, he said to me, he said, Sergeant Ray, you be the first guy I shoot once we cross the channel. Really, he didn't mean it because he and I were pretty good buddies, but he was, he was a little angry. And I guess I was, thought I was being tough, but I was really, maybe it wasn't the nicest thing I've ever done. Anyhow, while we're going into Normandy, crossing another hedgerow, one German plane came over and b dropped a bomb. And all my men were scattered throughout this hedgerow. And when uh, the plane had gone and we got up, we noticed Malloy was lying on the ground. Went over to him, had a couple of men take him to the aid station. And we got him to the aid station. Major Snyder, who examined him, looked up at me and shook his head no, like this, as if he wasn't going to make it. And Malloy happened to have his head turned to that side. He saw the the Major shake his head, and he turned his head over to me and looked up to me and says, I'm sorry, Sergeant Wapel. And we evacuated him. He died on the way to the general hospital. And I've, I've lived with that all my life. After the Brittany campaign, George, your unit moved to the Hurtgen Forest region of Germany. Can you tell us what you experienced in that region? Well, after the, the uh, Normandy campaign, going across France wasn't too bad. Then they put us up into the Hurricane Forest, relieved the 4th Division. Going into the forest, it was cold at this time. It was getting back in, in December. And the roads were muddy, and because of tree bursts, the, the top of the pine trees uh, had fallen, and it was almost like a jungle to get through. But, and the roads were muddy and frozen. And while we were driving up the roads, at the some previous trucks, when they, before it had frozen, there had been bodies laying in the ditch and, and, and in the road. And I remember one uh, arm sticking out of the mud where it had frozen and the body was under the mud. And the graves registration people would go along and, and just chop that arm off or dig up what was left of the body. And that was sad to see. And as we got deeper into the Hurtgen Forest, uh, the Germans became more 
resistant. And it, as I say, this is pine, it was a pine forest, and most of the treetops were blown over. And it was like, I visualize it to, like the wilderness in, in during the Civil War down in Charlottesville, uh, how it was. Uh, and, uh, and we broke out of the hurricane forest into the town of Gay. It was the first time we'd been on German soil. And the Germans fought, they fought very hard. They didn't want us to advance into Germany because it was the first time. And um, I remember back in the forest where the regimental CP was that uh, I, I made log cabins for the officers, the regimental commander, I made a log cabin for him, uh, like the, back in the old days where one log would fit into the slot of the other one. And I'd been a country boy, I knew how to swing an ax and, and <laughs> use a saw. And, uh, but we got into Germany there and uh, things were really tough. But then the Battle of the Bulge started and we were pulled out to go down to the Bulge. And uh, Christmas Day, I, had, uh, I was back in Aachen, Germany. That's where I had my Christ Christmas dinner of, of 44. It was, um, I had K rations for Christmas dinner, I remember that. That was a chocolate bar and a can of Spam, I think. The 83rd was ordered into the Battle of the Bulge on December 24th. Great Christmas present. Would you mind telling your audience what it was like to fight as an infantryman during the course of that battle? We relieved the, the uh, 75th Division, I think, and the dead, as a result of the bulge, and the people that had been killed were stacked up like cordwood. They were frozen, and they had put them head to foot, and it just looked like a stack of cordwood. And that was my indoctrination into the Battle of the Bulge. We unloaded in our trucks, we set up our CPs, the, the doughboys went forward, and, uh, and we uh, had the, uh, I think the 84th Division was on our right. And uh, my regiment, the 331st, was uh, detached from the division and attached to the 3rd Armored Division. So we went into the bulge from the time we were unloaded, back wherever it was, down to the Hoofley St. Vith Road. We were fighting with the 3rd Armored Division. We, we went down and cut that road. And that was about the time the war was over. But that was very vicious fighting. There, there was, we dressed also in white uniforms. So that because of the snow, that we, we weren't uh, seen as easily. But, um, and that was the time when the Germans were invading our front lines with the people who could speak English and American uniforms and Jeeps. And uh, you, you had to be very careful who you were talking to. It may have been German. So the front lines had that to contend with. And we weren't too far to the rear as with the regimental CP that I was responsible for. But that, that was tough. I remember at one time I'm with this Lieutenant Barnes. He was in the INR platoon, intelligence and reconnaissance. And I was with him. And he said, you see, there's, see just across that field about 200 yards, he says, all those people moving there are Germans. And uh, they know we're here and we know they're there. But uh, um, so it was a, it was a, it was a hell of a battle to get out that hurricane, I mean, the Battle of the Bulge. But finally, when the 3rd Armored Division broke that highway, and about that time, it was the first of the year, they were, Germans were started to withdraw back into Germany, and the bulge was over, and we with, were withdrawn. George, in the course of the battle, what were the weather conditions like? No, it was like zero. People's feet were freezing with their, with their boots on. Frostbite was one of the worst. We had more frostbite casualties than we had uh, bullet uh, casualties. It was very cold, and uh, the, the stoves that you were cooking on would freeze, the gas stoves, they would freeze. And if you got an egg put on your mess kit, uh, it would freeze, <laughs> so you would eat frozen eggs that was hot a second or two ago. It was very, very cold, and uh, we were in snow, and uh, I remember sleeping one night in a uh, barn that belonged to a Belgium, and I slept with this horses and cows. And because of the warmth of the horses and cows, it was much better than sleeping outside. But it was very cold. After the Battle of the Bulge, your unit was ordered to the Elbe River in April 1945. The mission of your unit was to contact the Russians as they were coming from the east. What were the Russians like when you met them? Well, as we got finished with the Bulge, we soon we backed off to the edge of the Elbe, and that's when the Russians came and we met them. Now I was there, but uh, the regimental commander uh, with an interpreter was talking to them. Just seeing them was like seeing a strange person out of Mars or something. Here we are, we're meeting, 
the war was over, and uh, it was they let the good times roll, I guess, then. They were a ragtag at that time. They were, they were moving in, in anything, horses and bicycles, and just, it was a ragtag, ragtag uh, organization that the ones we met, because they had been moving fast also, and, and had probably had equipment problems or logistic problems, and keeping up with the front soldier, as we had. After the war, George, you served with the Arlington Ceremonial Detail. What was life like, and what were your duties? Well, after the war was over, we moved back down south of Europe, and I came home with a number, it was a high point system that you came home on. So when my turn came, I went out of Marseille, came back to Boston, down to Fort Meade, and discharged. I had known enough people before the war that I knew that I wanted to get back to Fort Myer. So I went to the Pentagon, contacted a couple of people I had known before, re-enlisted, and was assigned as the first sergeant of the ceremonial detachment at Fort Myer, Virginia. Now, that detachment was made up of prime 5'8 to say 6'1 soldiers. They were the, uh, hand-picked, and we did the, our, our mission was to they bury the people at Arlington Cemetery, do the guarding at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, do the honor guards around Washington, the parades, and also uh, myself plus nine other uh, people to be the best, in my opinion, were selected to be ushers at the White House at the re uh, diplomatic receptions. I, being the first sergeant, was in charge, so I you know, took him in. I met President and Mrs. Truman. I guess there were probably half a dozen receptions each year, 46, 47, that we attended. And we, I got to know the old chap pretty well. What were your impressions, George? Well, he, he had been a soldier himself. He had been a captain in World War I. And um, I remember Mrs. Truman uh, said that her punch uh, kicked like a Missouri mule. That in one night after the last reception, I think probably in 47, um, uh, President Truman came to me and says, if you and your soldier want to stay and after the other f f diplomatics leave, uh, I'll play the piano, we have some punch, and we'll sing. And naturally, I had to sing when the caissons go rolling along because he had been an artilleryman during World War I. So by the evening's end, he had the Secret Service escort us back to Fort Myer because he didn't think probably we could make it. And he was probably right. But that, that was a gala time, and it was something I'll never forget. Before being commissioned as an officer, you served on General Omar Bradley's security detail. What were your impressions of General Omar Bradley? Uh, driving for General Bradley was an honor. And I soon got to know a little about him. He liked sports. He followed the, everything, his sports of all nature. And like uh, uh, what the time was, a special horse ran the a race at Pimlico, uh, or Ted Williams batting average. So when I found out he knew that, I'd get the paper early. So we talked from Fort Myer to the Pentagon about uh, the sports of the day. So uh, he, he knew that I'd been a combat soldier on him in Europe because he asked me. Uh, and he, we talked about that for a little while. But uh, generally speaking, he was a great guy. And it was an honor working for him. Then he got promoted. To, to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I was there at the Pentagon, and uh, when he got that promotion, I took him over to the White House when he received the bars from President Truman. And uh, it was a great honor working for him. He was a good soldier. Have you ever also met uh, General Dwight David Eisenhower? Oh, yes, yes. After um, General Eisenhower retired and was at Columbia University and the Korean War broke out, uh, he was called down to Washington by the president and uh, he came to the Pentagon, and uh, I would chauffeur General Eisenhower and General Bradley over to the White House. And in fact, one time, I remember when we left the White House, uh, General Eisenhower and General Bradley and the three other chiefs of staff of the Air Force and the Navy and the Marines all got in the same car. And here I'm driving the, the controlling people of the whole army. I often, I've often wondered, what would have happened if I'd have taken a right turn going across 14th Street Bridge? I'd have made the headlines for sure. But it was interesting. Uh, I was there during the crisis between General MacArthur and, and the uh, Korean War 
And when uh, General Bradley and Eisenhower and all of them decided that he had to go, Truman took the buck for that, but General Bradley was, and his chiefs of staff were the people that really, in my opinion, got General MacArthur fired, but, but uh, President uh, Truman, you know, he says the buck stops here, so he's the one who took the blame for it. And when, I remember when uh, General MacArthur came home, we had a honor guard for him down in the monumental grounds, and the president was there, and all the chiefs of staff, and the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, and General MacArthur went down the receiving line. General Bradley put out his arm, hand to shake uh, General MacArthur's, and General MacArthur just ignored it. I do know you earned a number of medals, and I would appreciate if you tell our audience about the medals that you did receive. Well, this medal right here is a combat infantry badge with a star, which means that the combat infantry badge was for Europe. Anytime you fought from a regimental level down, you got the combat infantry badge. After the war was over, the Department of the Army decided that anyone who had that badge should get a bronze star. So I got a bronze star for my meritorious service in Europe. And then I have a, a, another bronze star that I got for meritorious service in in Korea. And then, uh, let's see, there's one missing. I, I got two bronze stars in Europe, and, and one after the war, and then one in Korea. Then I got the uh, commendation ribbon, which uh, it's about the same as a bronze star for military service. I got that four times, uh, actually five times. I got the medal and, and four clusters on it. So generally speaking, I guess I did a pretty good job. <laughs> What was your most memorable moment in your military career? Well, the thing that I most thought of most was my mother. I love my mother. She sent me a, a picture of herself during the war. Said she said a prayer for me. At 9 o'clock every morning, That's on my medal board. I'm very proud of that. That stayed with me forever. But working for all those space for people, I'm so proud to have done it. I was so proud to have been a part of World War II. So proud of the job that I did at Fort Myer after the war, and I'm proud of, to have been a part of the Korean War. And uh, I met an awful lot of people during my life and I'm so proud to have been a part of all of it and the people I've met and the things that I've done. I, I think that my mama would be proud of me. George, what is the legacy of World War II? Well, you know, that we won it and uh, that uh, we were all proud to have been a part of it. And uh, uh, we did it for Uncle Sam. And we did it for our, our home, home base, our families and our people that uh, lived in the United States. That's why we fought it, and, uh, and that's why we all fought till some of them died, and many of them died. But uh, I'm sure if you could wake up the dead, they would say themselves that they were proud to have been a part of it, and they would do it again if they had to.